السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا قال تعالى في كتابه الحكيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وكذلك مكنا ليوسف في الأرض يتبوأ منها حيث يشاء نصيب برحمتنا من نشاء ولا نضيع أجر المحسنين صدق الله العلي العظيم وصلوا على محمد وآل محمد Chapter number 12 of the Quran, Surah Yusuf, is quite frankly a literary masterpiece. It's one of the only chapters in the Quran that narrates the story of a prophet in chronological order. And of course, all of the stories of the prophets, there are benefits to draw from. But particularly, this chapter begins with the verses, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alif Lam Ra. تلك آيات الكتاب المبين إنا أنزلناه قرآنا عربيا لعلكم تعقلون نحن نقص عليك أحسن القصص بما أوحينا إليك هذا القرآن وإن كنت من قبله لمن الغافلين So verse number three says that we relate to you Ya Rasulullah the best and the most beneficial of stories and no other story of any prophet is prefaced by a statement like this because when you read a story, or when you listen to a story, you know, generally, we tend to forget the words that we hear, except for the stories that we hear. And there's, there's research that's done on why this is significant. There was research done recently by a professor at Princeton University who said that it was explaining scientifically what happens biologically and scientifically to us when we listen to a story. He says when, when someone listens to a story, the person who's listening to the story, their brain waves actually sync up with the storyteller. And that when you're listening to a story, parts of the brain become uh, activated, which allow you to uh, understand the person who's telling the story on a deeper level. You start to understand their, their, their motivations and uh, basically more of what they're trying to convey. So stories are very powerful. And the Qur'an says that we relate to you, Ya Rasulullah, the best of stories. Not stories that are just entertaining. You know, when you, when you consume content, when you watch a movie, some movies, they're, they're just entertaining, some TV shows. They're, made, they're meant to entertain. They're not meant to teach anything. They're not meant to inspire. They're not meant to motivate in any way, shape, or form. So there's a lot of content out there, and it's important for us to be selective with the content that we consume. Don't just consume content which is entertaining. Consume content which also inspires you and, and, and you learn something from. So chapter number 12, Surah Yusuf, is a literary masterpiece in that regard. And obviously, there are multiple areas where it's considered a masterpiece in terms of uh, art, uh, dream interpretation, even stories on leadership and proper management. So the Quran says that it uses a particular word when it comes to uh, Yusuf and what God granted him. He says, وَكَذَلِكَ مَكَّنَّا لِيُوسُفْ Tamkin. See, the word tamkin means to empower. God says that we gave power to the Prophet Yusuf. And, and that word comes from the word makan or makana. When we say makan in Arabic, what's the definition of the word makan? Place or position. Makana means positioning. So we gave him position, meaning that we gave him empowerment. We gave him rank. And we gave him power. So, and with great power comes great responsibility. You know, this is one thing that, that is true in life, that the more power you are given, the more authority, the more influence you're given, the more there is responsibility. So, the Prophet Yusuf, what was so 
interesting. And in, in, in the next few minutes, I want to take some time to talk about some lessons that we can draw from this chapter. Is that the Prophet Yusuf السلام, spent a lot of time in seclusion. He spent a lot of time in isolation. You know, today we live in a world where we carry our devices around, our smartphones, and the level of dependence that we have on our phones, it's, it's almost like it's like a, like a bionic arm. It's almost like it's a piece of us. It's almost like it's a part of us. If you've ever left the home while forgetting your phone, forget about leaving the home. If you've ever fallen asleep and you've woken up and you're looking for your phone, you realize it's not there and God forbid you left it in the living room and not by your bedside table, what happens? You feel like there's a piece of you that's missing. And so in the world that we live in today, it's very difficult to detach from everything and to learn to live in isolation and in peace. I don't know if I shared the story, but a couple of months ago, I think it was in early January, um, and I don't know if Orange County was affected. I know LA County was affected. There was severe rain, and the city that I was living in, trees were falling all over the place, and power lines were cut off. And I, I remember the power cut off for about 36 hours. It was from uh, Friday night at uh, 11 p.m. to around Sunday morning at 11 a.m. And I remember feeling, uh, feeling helpless because not only was the Wi-Fi out, which is more important than obviously electricity and food and water and oxygen is Wi-Fi, but uh, the, the, the cell phone towers, I guess, were affected. So there was almost no connection and I couldn't handle it. After a few hours, I got up and went to my parents' house where thankfully there was Wi-Fi connection. But it goes to show that as human beings, we've reached the stage where it's very difficult for us to live in isolation and actually enjoy our own presence without being entertained, without having some sort of connection which pings us and reminds us that we're attached to the outside world. And you know, a sign of, a sign of maturity and a sign of leadership is when you start to enjoy your own presence and when you can truly disconnect from the world. The world's greatest leaders, they spent time in isolation. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he spent time in isolation. He spent time isolating himself, not completely because he, would, he was you know, a man of the people and he would spend time uh, you know, in the market and he would spend time socializing and leading the community. But his inspiration came when he was in isolation, when he was on his own in the cave, Ghar Hira. And that's where he received the first few verses of Revelation. Isolation gives you a chance to look inwards and focus on yourself. There's a narration that says, Man arafa nafsa, when you get to know yourself, Man arafa nafsa, faqad arafa rabba. He or she who knows himself or her, herself will know their Lord. That's how you get to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you get to know in your when you get to know yourself because God has created the greatest signs that reside within the human being. Al Imam Musa al Kazim alayhi salam spent much of his life in prison, similar to the Prophet Yusuf a number of years. And when he was in prison, his attitude was not, why is this happening to me? I should be outside. I'm the Imam of the people. I should have contact with people and I'm supposed to be guiding and leading. Oh God, why did you put me in prison? His attitude was, oh Allah, thank you for putting me in this position because I have been waiting for a chance to isolate myself so I can develop my relationship with you. Because the outside world tends to distract us. And so he was thankful for that, posi for, for, for that position that God had placed him in. When you read the autobiography of Malcolm X, I had a chance recently to read it. It's a great book if you're young in here, or I mean, whatever age you are, it's a great book to read. And he talks about the transformation that happened when he was in prison. He says he grew up on the street as a gangster, as a hustler, and finally he got in trouble and he landed himself in prison. Well, in prison, there was really no more trouble to get into. So what did he dedicate his time to? He went to the library and he read every single book in the library and he opened up the dictionary and he read the dictionary from A to Z and improved his vocabulary. That's why when he emerged from prison, he was a powerful speaker. He was a powerful orator because he spent time in isolation and he just hit the books, he hit the library and it started to change him, started to change his mindset about what he wanted to do with his life and how he wanted to serve for the rest of his life. So, you know, learning how to, to live in isolation and just be comfortable with your own self, 
We don't necessarily need somebody with you all the time. You don't need somebody pinging you and sending you messages and notifications all the time. Learn to enjoy your own presence. Happiness really comes from within. So going back to the story of the Prophet Yusuf السلام, because he also spent time in isolation in the darkness of that well. And then he was brought out of that well. He was taken to the home of the highest minister in Egypt. And then he found himself in a dark prison for many years again. And it was during those times, the time that he was in the darkness of the well and the darkness of the prison where he found his true strength. And he emerged as a confident individual. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when he finally had the chance, when he interpreted the dream of the king correctly and he got the king's attention, when he had that chance, finally he presented himself as a confident, competent, and trustworthy individual. Because when God says, وَكَذَلِكَ مَكَّنَّا لِيُوسُفَ فِي الْأَرْضِ That we empowered Yusuf, it wasn't just because he happened to be the son of a prophet, that he happened to be the son of Ya'qub. No. Ya'qub had many other sons, but none of them, none of them reached in confidence and competence and trustworthiness like Yusuf did. In fact, there's a story that we learn from the narrations. It says that one day Ya'qub gathered his sons when they were all young and he sent them out. And he said, I have a mission for you to execute. He says, I want you all to go out and find a small animal, a bird, a chicken, whatever it is. And I want you in private to go and slaughter that animal and bring it back. And so all of them went out, except for the Prophet Yusuf. He came back and he you know, he, he, he didn't fulfill. He basically didn't kill the animal. So they asked him, he said, why did you not fulfill? He said, you told me to go in private where nobody would see me. And everywhere I went, I noticed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I remembered that he was looking over me. He was watching me. So his level of consciousness is what earned him what the Quran says, وَكَذَلِكَ مَكَّنَّا Yusuf." We empowered him, not just because he was the son of a prophet, not just because he was a really, really handsome, good-looking guy, because he was, but because he had consciousness. And that was the source of his own confidence. So what are three characteristics or qualities that the Prophet Yusuf saw within himself? Number one, he saw within himself the characteristic of confidence. He was a confident individual. When he had his chance and he stood in front of the king, he said, قَالَ جَعَلْنِي عَلَى خَزَائِنِ الْأَرْضِ إِنِّي حَفِيظٌ عَلِيمٌ When he interpreted the dream of the king, the king said, okay, well, what can I do you in, in return? Because the, the interpretation of the dream was significant. That he, the, the, the king saw a dream that seven skinny cows were eating seven fat cows. And because he interpreted that dream correctly, meaning that there would be seven years of abundance and then there would be seven years of droughts followed by another year of abundance, they were able to save the lives of their people. They were able to plant enough crops during the years of abundance and save so that when the seven years of, um, seven years of scarcity and drought came around, they were not affected. They could feed their people. So the implications of the dream that he interpreted were heavy. So he saw him as a competent individual. He asked him, what do you want in return for interpreting this dream? Yusuf alayhi salam said, قَالَ جَعَلْنِي عَلَى خَزَائِنِ الْأَرْضِ إِنِّي حَفِيظٌ عَلِيمٌ He had the confidence to say that, allow me to be the manager of the storehouses. Basically, allow me, give me the position of uh, managing the treasury. The highest position when it comes to managing the assets and resources. And this is a man who had just come out of prison. However, he had confidence. And confidence is important. Confidence, you know, if you're, if you're a young person today, work on your confidence. Because confidence will take you very far in life. So how do you build confidence? Confidence comes from your image of yourself, your self-image. How do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as worthy? Do you see yourself with potential? regardless of what people say about you, regardless of what people have said about you, regardless of people have not met your expectations or have disappointed you or have walked out of your life, 
Don't let that affect your sense of confidence in who you are as an individual. Because nobody can determine your worth except your Creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all of us are created equal. There is not one person who is superior to the next or one person who is inferior to the next. God has created all of us with equal opportunity, with equal potential in terms of our nafs, our soul. Not one is better than the rest, not one is worse than the rest. But how do you view yourself? How do you view yourself? When you look in the mirror, what do you see? Do you see a confident individual? Do you see someone who has potential? And how do your words reflect what you see in the mirror? There was a book written a number of years ago. Actually, it was written in the, in the I believe in the 1940s, if I'm not mistaken. The name of the book is Psycho-Cybernetics. It was written by a gentleman by the name of Maxwell Maltz. Maxwell Maltz, by profession, was a plastic surgeon. But he went and studied psychology after opening his plastic surgery practice because he wanted to understand the psychology of his patients. Because some of them, he would perform, or most of them rather, he would perform plastic surgery on, you know, he would fix their nose, their ears, their face, whatever it was. Most of them, when they would emerge from surgery, they felt better about themselves. There was a small group of them who it didn't make any difference for them. So he was trying to figure out the psychology of, you know, why don't they feel better about themselves? They have an improved image on the outside. And what he realized was, it doesn't matter how much you improve your image on the outside. Forget about the facelift, forget about the Botox, forget about the, I don't know, the different procedures that they have these days. He says, what's going on on the inside? He said, a lot of people, they don't need a physical facelift, they need a spiritual facelift. They need to reevaluate. He said, I had a patient one time come to me and beg for no surgery. And I was begging him. He said, I could have made the money. He said, but I was trying my hardest to convince him that there's nothing wrong with your nose. It's an average size nose. But he was convinced somehow on the inside because of his, what we call hadithun nafs, the internal speech, the self-talk, that there was something wrong with his nose and he had to get it fixed. He said, this guy's problem was not a physical problem. This guy's problem was a mental problem. It was an emotional problem. It was a spiritual problem. So he went and studied psychology in order to understand the psychology of why some people have a strong self-image, why some people see themselves high, highly, why some people value themselves, and why others do not. And it shows in people's behaviors. Who you choose to associate with, your habits, your thoughts, your speech, all of that either builds confidence or it destroys confidence. There's a statement computer science used. It's a small acronym, a phrase, G-I-G-O. Garbage in, garbage out. If you put garbage, if you're programming a system and you put garbage into that system, what can you expect to get from that system? Well, the brain is exactly like a computer system. It's actually the most powerful computer on earth. There is no man-made computer which can match the power of the human brain with all the advancements in AI and tech and everything that they're promising us, nothing can even come close to the power of the human brain. It's that same system. If you put in garbage, if you're listening to garbage, if you're watching garbage, if you're speaking garbage, that's exactly what's going to come out. Al-Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, he says, watch your thoughts because your thoughts become your words and your words become your behaviors and your behaviors become your habits and your habits become your character, and your character becomes your destiny. Something as simple as a thought translates into the destiny and the direction of your life. The link between it is your habits. And your habits do not happen out of coincidence. They do not happen out of a vacuum. There's a story I read recently about a French philosopher by the name of Denis Diderot. He lived in the 1700s and he was the author of uh, one of the most comprehensive encyclopedias at the time. Well, in the year 1765, he had a problem. He wanted to marry off one of his daughters, but he was a poor man. You know, he didn't have the money to do so. So one of his fans, someone who was really, ad who admired uh, his work, was the Empress of Russia at the time, Catherine the Great. So when she heard that he was in financial trouble, she agreed to purchase his entire personal library collection for a sum which in today's worth is somewhere around $150,000. And she also employed him as her personal librarian and she paid him 50 years of salary ahead of time in advance. So 
And she told him, keep the books with you. You don't have to bring them to Russia, keep them with you. Just be my personal librarian. If I want information, send it my way. So all of a sudden, now he's got money, right? So he, he's able to pay for his daughter's wedding and he's got a little bit of leftover money. So he spends a little bit on himself. He goes and buys himself a nice robe, a nice scarlet robe. Well, the problem is he walked into his office and his home. He looked at his robe. It's not matching what he's wearing. It's not matching the rest of his wardrobe. It's not matching his office and his home. So he thinks, you know, I, I have to start making adjustments. So he starts to spend his money. He buys sculptures for his house. He goes and buys a, a rug from Damascus. He uh, replaces his straw chair with a leather chair. You know, he, he completely changes his wardrobe because one thing, one habit leads to another. This is what, this is what uh, psychologists call habit stacking. That when you change one thing, you start to change another. You know, if I myself one day, instead of wearing a cheap Apple watch, start to wear a Rolex, all of a sudden I feel, you know, this, well, this Rolex, I can't wear a Rolex on a podium that's made out of this wood. We have to change this to marble, right? And then if we change this to marble, we're going to have to, you know, upgrade what we have around here. One change leads to another change. Habits do not come out of a vacuum. They don't happen out of coincidence. So going back to the example of habits, that your thoughts become your words, your words become your behaviors, your behaviors become your habits, your habits become your character, your character becomes your destiny. So it's important when it comes to the issue of confidence, going back to that issue of confidence, what habits do you have? What self-talk habits do you have? Who are the people that you associate with? Are they people who lift you up, inspire you, or are they just people who are keeping you entertained? There's a narration that tells us who our true friends really are. And this has a lot to do with our confidence, the friends that we choose. It says, Sadiquka man sadaqak la man la man sadaqak. Sadiquka man sadaqak la man sadaqak. Your true friend is the one that holds you to the truth. The one that holds you accountable, not the one that believes everything you say. Not the person who is a yes man who just agrees with everything that you do, who never challenges you, who never holds you accountable. If you find people that you're hanging out with, they never challenge you and they never hold you accountable, that's a dangerous sign. The narration says, Al-Mu'min, Mir'atul Mu'min. A believer is the mirror of a believer. A mirror not only highlights your best attributes, it shows you your blemishes. It shows you the things that you don't want to see. That's why when you go to you know, they, they have like those makeup mirrors, right? One side, it just shows you from a distance where you can't really see the blemishes or anything like that. The other side, it shows, it shows you a much more uh, up-close view of your face so that you can see the blemishes on the face and whatever on the skin. So your friend is not the one who just believes you and nods his head or her head. It's the one that holds you accountable. And this is where, this is one of our prime sources of confidence the people that you associate with. What are you listening to? What are you reading? The content that you're consuming. Is it something which is just entertaining to keep the time passing? Or is it something which inspires you to improve yourself? So number one, the Prophet Yusuf السلام, out of his qualities saw within himself confidence. Number two is competence. See, confidence can come from competence. But if you don't have competence, you won't be confident for very long. Competence is when you actually have fruit on the tree. See, sometimes for a temporary amount of time, you can fake confidence, but you can never fake competence because competence is based on actual skill. So competence is when you can deliver. It's when you have skill. And there's a difference between talent and skill. Some people are talented. They have a natural ability to do a certain task. You know, some athletes, right, because of their height, because of their physical structure, they're very talented. However, if you don't work on that talent, it never becomes skill. That's why you see sometimes players, if you watch sports in the NBA and NFL and whatnot, other sports, that they're very talented, but their talent goes to waste because they don't take their talent seriously and they don't actually develop it into a skill. Whereas sometimes you have people who are not so talented but because they put more hours into development, they become more skilled than the per people who are naturally talented. 
So developing yourself, self-development, is a price that we need to pay. Outside, if you're young, outside of school and outside of work, find time to practice self-development. Work on your skill set. That will develop competence. And if, if you develop competence, you can go very far in this world. Don't just be satisfied with the, the, the few hours of school that you go to in a day and say, you know what, that's enough. That's all that's required from me. Become hungry when it comes to developing yourself. I heard a story from one time from my maternal, uh, my maternal grandfather, actually, Ayatollah Sayyid Fadl Milani. And you know, he, was a, he was a student in, in, in the Hausa in, in the city of Najaf. And his father, my great grandfather, you know, he was very old school, so he, he didn't want his son, who was my grandfather, to do any academic studies at the university. He just wanted him to focus on his Hausa studies. But my grandfather really wanted to study academic studies. So he did so without, without informing his father, my great-grandfather. And it was to a point where, and this was in another city, this was in the city of Baghdad, so there's a difference, you know, there's a distance between Najaf and Baghdad. Najaf is where the Hausa was, Baghdad was where the university was. And so he would, you know, when he would have to take uh, courses or, or some tests, he would have to go to Baghdad without even his own father knowing. And so his mother, my great-grandmother, would ask, uh, when, when, the great, when my great-grandfather would ask my great-grandmother, where is, where is he, where has he gone, because he would, you know, take long to come back, she would have to use the excuse that he's, you know, gone out, he's busy, he's with his friends. I thought to myself, subhanAllah, in our generation, we did the exact opposite. We would tell our parents that we're studying or we're at the library where we'd be hanging out with his friends. He would have to do the opposite because he was so hungry in receiving that academic degree and he had no other excuse to tell his parents that he was out hanging out with his friends. This is hunger. This is when you start to develop competence. This is how hungry you have to become in life to improve yourself. Because guess what? Nobody's going to hand you anything. If you go out there in the world with an entitlement mentality that the world owes me a job, the world owes me a career, the world owes me money, the world owes me success, the world, oh, that, doesn't, that doesn't fly anymore in this world. So develop yourself. Work on yourself. You know, we all complain about the top 10%. Why don't you become part of the top 10%? Why don't you become top of the, in, in the top 5%, the top 1% that everybody is complaining about? Sometimes we only know how to point the finger. Why don't you work on yourself? Become elite. Become a competent person. And when you do, the avenues will open up. Everything that you wish for in life, whether it has to do with career, finance, relationships, spirituality, anything, anything will be at your doorstep. The, uh, the opportunities will come to you instead of you pursuing the opportunities. But you have to work on your competence. So the Prophet Yusuf السلام, wasn't just confident, he was also competent, meaning that he can deliver results. So when he asked for the favor to become the, uh, you know, the, the, basically the minister and the person that was in charge of the treasury and the assets in the storehouse, he was able to actually deliver on those results. So this is number two. We said confidence, we said competence, and number three is trust. Amana. Being a person of amana. So important in this day and age. Because you can have, um, you can have competence, you can have confidence, but if you're not a trustworthy individual, that's very dangerous. If you've ever worked with someone who's competent, who's confident, but is not trustworthy, run in the other direction because they can do a lot of damage, because they know exactly what they're doing, but they're not a trustworthy individual. So having amana, trustworthiness, is very important. Al-Imam Zain al-Abideen salam, he says the following. He says that if my father's murderer was to hand me the dagger that he used to kill my father as a trust, as an amana, I would give it back to him upon request. That's how non-personal it was. So having, being a trustworthy person. The king said to the Prophet Yusuf, قَالَ إِنَّكَ الْيَوْمَ لَدَيْنَا مَكِينٌ أَمِينٌ That now that you have proven yourself, you are now a trustworthy person. Now we can trust you with the assets of this nation. So being a trustworthy individual, and, and trust really takes time. Trust, building trust really takes time. There's a narration that says, 
that when you treat people, treat them, give them the benefit of the doubt. When you come across an individual, give them the benefit of the doubt 50 times before you remove it from them. Meaning that you should view people as innocent until proven guilty, not guilty until proven innocent. Learn to extend trust. It's important that if we want people to trust us, we must also become trustworthy individuals. And trust is not something that you can fake. Trust is not something that you can purchase. Trust is not something that you can just pray for and acquire. It takes work. And what, what, is, what is the currency of trust? It's character. It's who you are when people are not looking. It's who you are behind all of the veils. It's very, it's very difficult, but it's also attainable. I want to just take a couple of minutes and um, of course tomorrow is, is the 14th of Ramadan, the day after is the 15th and the 15th is the day in which we celebrate the birth of Imam Al-Hasan Al-Mujtaba salawatullah wa salamu alayhi. So tomorrow inshallah we will be, be celebrating his birth and his life. But just a couple of words on the character and the trustworthiness of Imam Al-Hasan Al-Mujtaba, a man who literally the, the, his entire world turned against him. But that did not change his character. It didn't change who he was on the inside. And that's a true sign of success. That no matter what happens to you in life, it doesn't change your character. You don't become sour and bitter. You don't absorb and start to hurt people just because you've been hurt in life. And he was known for his generosity, his immense generosity. Narrations would tell us that people during the time of the rule of his father, and Imam Amir al-Mu'min in Al-Kufa, they would go to the Imam, his father, for assistance. He would give them assistance and then he would point them to the house of his son. He said, my son also has something to give you as well. Because of, he knew that his son loved to give. He was obsessed with generosity. And it's something that he learned from none other than his family members. A narration says that one day Imam al-Hasan al-Mujtaba salam comes upon his mother, Lady Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam, and he sees her in her mihrab, she's praying, she's supplicating. And she is mentioning everyone in her supplication except herself. She was praying for the entire community, mentioning the names of every member of the community. And so finally he turned to her. He said, you pray for everyone except for yourself. She said, Bunay, my dear son, al-jar thumma dar the neighbor, then the home. Think of others before you think about yourself. And your neighbor is not just the person who literally lives next door to you. One narration tells us that your neighbor, your neighbors are 40 people to the right and 40 people to the left. And we know that 40 is a significant number, which means that anyone who you come in contact with can be considered your neighbor, anybody who's really part of your community. So think about them before we think of ourselves. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the intercession of our Prophet and the Imams of Ahlul Bayt We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these holy nights to accept our a'mal, our fasting. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to strengthen our spirits. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring relief to all of those worldwide who are in need. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma khfil al-mu'minina wal-mu'minat wal-muslimina wal-muslimat al-ahya'i minhum wal-amwat tabi'a baynana wa baynahum bil khayrat إنك مجيب الدعوات إنك قاضي الحاجات إنك على كل شيء قدير برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين